again tonight i'm very happy to uh greet you to welcome you to our what i thought was the 15th but it's 14th panel i miscounted by one yeah so i want to just say a little bit about uh, last meeting um due to confidentiality issues we had no um, permission to record that last meeting, um, but I will only sketch for you because of that reason, um, the case that was presented to us last time by uh, Andrei Yastremitsky. Um, as with so many other cases that had been presented to us, we were once again very impressed by the clinical ingenuity of the therapist by Andrei and also by the therapeutic success he accomplished in a very short period of time. This is sort of what we've observed now over a period of time that within 10 or 11 sessions, these patients tend to go home or leave the hospital. As you know by now, the ones uh, uh, who have attended these meetings regularly, I've made it my task in addition to moderating the discussion to review quickly the last case we've heard and discuss to provide in a, a kind of element of continuity during these otherwise very disruptive and disturbing times. By sort of stringing these cases together as if they all existed in an ongoing chain of significant links, um, I hope to offer you and us a compendium of clinical material and reflections that will be helpful and useful to the clinical work performed daily and under extremely uncertain conditions in the Ukraine since the beginning of the war in February 2022. So I'll just give a few elements not to reveal much of uh, the identity of this case, but Andre presented to us a case of a soldier who also was a father of two children who had been caused in an intense warfare um, and who had engaged in military battles in Bakhmut. He came to the Lev hospital with symptoms of incontinence and a total immobility and insensitivity to his lower body. He could not walk and he had to wear diapers, which of course caused him a great sense of embarrassment. In addition, he had no control over his body and his sexuality. At first, he showed no interest in pursuing any kind of psychotherapy and was rather dismissive of Andre when he was introduced to him. How could anyone help him, given the battles and terrors he had faced and experienced? He also had the classic symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, a term I will come back to in a moment nightmares, lack of sleep, intrusive thoughts, and haunting memories. What was once again remarkable in this case was how the therapist Andre survived his newly referred patient's psychological attacks by patiently but consistently offering him the therapeutic help <coughs> he so badly needed. Eventually, the patient began to talk recounting the horrors he had lived through, the many deaths he had witnessed, and the additional task he was commanded to perform, which was to inform the families of his dead buddies of their death, and there were quite a few. So in that service, he stepped into the role of the therapon, a position Francoise Thervon has described many times for us, the therapon has namely the duty, uh, and who's the second in combat, he has the duty to take care of his friends' bodies and souls, and he's also the first one to receive the broken and often hollow words of a shattered person, uh, of a shattered soul, and falling for us. Due to complex and dangerous circumstances in these battles near Bakhmut, this soldier returned from the front with a great set sense of guilt, which led to his wish to isolate himself from others. 
through a combination of trauma-focused therapy and regular analytic listening, the soldier came back to life, feeling his body again and even regaining his sexual desire. Both Francoise and Jerry remarked upon the helpfulness of the therapist's stubbornness to stay with the patient and to survive his initial dismissive attacks. In addition, Jerry also drew attention to the fact that the clinical disorder, which usually we know by post-traumatic disorder, is a misnomer, one that should be rather called post-traumatic injury. So it's not a disorder, but maybe Jerry, you can talk about this again today. <clears throat> one move that also had a tremendous effect on the patient, we believed afterwards, is that the therapist decided to sit across from him in a chair spontaneously on the ward of the hospital and to join him as his therapon, his body, on the public floor of the hospital. Something about that intimacy and respect helped the patient to finally shed many tears over all the losses he had endured during the war. At this time, Francoise reminded us of Virgil, the Latin poet's famous verse. I only give you the English one because my Latin is not so good. There are tears in the universe and sometimes deadly matters touch the mind. The poets from antiquity came once again to be of tremendous help to us when we spoke about the rather common reaction of soldiers going berserk. This had been the case at one moment in the soldier's life in the midst of the war. However, rather than being shocked by it, Francoise reminded us that in antiquity, when there is a betrayal of one's command, as was the case when Agamemnon stole from Achilles his bounty share, the, the soldiers lost their human bearings and went berserk. At times like these, I think it is so important to find comfort in the old ones, in the tales and the stories of antiquity, so that we can realize that the Ukrainians are not alone, but that their brave battles bear many reminders with the wars in, in Greece. Now, let me introduce to you Oleg Beresiuk. Um, I, I want to remind you that actually we have planned for Alexander Fils to present a case, which he was very willing to do, but his patient didn't give him permission to do so. So that's why Alexander kindly asked Oleg if he could present uh, a case to us. And Oleg by now is an old timer to us because um, in the summer he had presented two incredible cases to us already. So we're very fortunate to have you again. Um, Oleg is an assistant professor of psychiatry and psychotherapy at the Liv National Medical University Center. He is a psychoanalyst trained in individual and Adlerian analysis, who has organized a specialized psychiatric department of psychotherapeutic Re rehabilitation center for soldiers who were injured by the war. At one point, Oleg was also a member of the Ukrainian parliament, heading, I'm not sure I pronounce this correctly, but the Samopomich movement or party, you can correct me. And before we start, I again want to um, really thank Oksana for uh, your wonderful translation work. And of course, Francoise and Jerry for being there again and helping us along the way with these always very interesting and often disturbing cases. Thank you. Oleg, it's your turn. Yeah, thank you, Jane. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for this invitation. As for me, it's a great honor, honor and pleasure uh, to to be with all of you. And, uh, uh, um, and now I will start in Ukrainian. Uh, it would be much comfortable for me to present you this case. I would like to talk to you uh, about Ivan of 24 years, an uh, officer. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I would like to start now. So 
there will be uh, several parts to my uh, to my presentation. The first one is unusual beginning, and I would like you to meet Ivan. He is a 24-year-old officer in the Forces of Special Operation. Ivan. Uh, uh, came to his buddy telling him that he could no, no longer cope with the feeling of nausea. He cannot throw up anymore. He, he cannot suffer from the, his inability to sleep because it seemed to him that he had not been sleeping for a few weeks now. And he also felt that he was going insane. So he left his phone with his buddy and he passed it on to me. He, he phone number, I mean. So I called Ivan and uh, after this brief uh, interaction we had, he, he suddenly said at the beginning, I'll come to you only because you called me. And then in two months, he uh, called me again and said that he had come. So I called this part of the the unusual beginning because I had not I had never called before or after uh, the front line to invite a patient. This part two, the the head of hell. The first meeting, this uh, handsome, athletic, uh, young man of middle height neatly dressed and neatly uh, and his hair was neatly cut. he got he was a little tense he started uh, the conversation himself if the uh, treatment does not work out i will kill everyone and everyone who everyone who's going to be around me at the moment why would you kill everyone i'm in hell and I'm the head of this house, so I do as I please. But you are at a, a department at the best hospital in Ukraine, and we're taking care of you. And we can tell we we can tell that everything is going to work out. Okay, we'll see," said he. But everything has to be uh, fine, and everyone has to do things right just warn them about it okay uh, I'll I'll warn them but they will do everything they have to do according to their duties in order to take good care of you and he suddenly changed the subject and said I'm really I'm really worried about my girlfriend I'm afraid that she might get killed can I go and see her but you you're talking to her on the phone that's not enough. You will certainly go to see her after we take all the necessary tests. Remember how you told me that you were going to come because you called me? So I thank you for your trust. So I, uh, so will you please stay and we will work together. Now we have to set your sleep straight and drop down your anxiety and get rid of uh, bad dreams. So unexpectedly, so may the for me, the patient says, okay, I agree. We shook hands and the patient went to his ward. To my great surprise, my counter-transference was totally opposite, opposite to the pictures the patient was picturing and, and to the tension that seemingly was there during the conversation. I was listening to him calmly, freely, and bravely. And I spoke to him bravely with trust to him. And I was sitting there and wondering why it was like this. And I suddenly had this memory from my childhood about a cartoon, Kapitoshka, it's a Ukrainian, about an imaginary character. And about this little wolf, there was this little wolf who was real, really worried that he was not scary enough and nobody was afraid of him. So he did everything. He was doing everything. Uh, so everyone uh, is afraid of him and will not make fun of him. So all, all our Ukrainian audience remembers that 
cartoon. So you could you could watch it if you want a good night's sleep before you go to bed. So he so this little wolf made uh, friends with this cap uh, Capitoshka who was a actually a drop of rain, and uh, he saw his himself and his kindness in his friend. This is how I thought of this situation. Okay, part three, the wolf and Capitoshka. During the second meeting, I asked Ivan to tell me a bit about himself. And I heard a really formal account, uh, which also was combined with complaints about uh, doctors and nurses who did not cater to his needs or dismissed him. He told me he was from Trinidad region and he was born to a nuclear family. He didn't have any uh, brothers or sisters. He was an A student at school because his mother told him to study. Then he finished nine grades and then went to a military lyceum. And after graduating, he went to the military academy and became an officer of the uh, forces of special operations. And then he signed a contract with the army. He's not married. He has no children. And on the 24th of February, 2022, he went to war. Listening to the whole thing at one point and looking at how Ivan was trying to be scary and angry, I decided to share my uh, yesterday's my memory from the day before about Kapitoshka from uh, my childhood. And he had never seen the cartoon. And I told him about how, about how the uh, characters became friends. And I suggested that he suggested that we watch it together. I found it quickly on YouTube, it's really short. And so we watched it together. So we did it in silence and after we finished, there was this calm silence and atmosphere of warmth. So he was silent and I said, you know, sometimes anger is just energy, which can be uh, turned into love and happiness. And we st somehow just uh, finished this meeting. I don't know how. And thinking about this meeting afterwards, I, I felt like a Pitoshka and I really wanted to be him. I felt well being him and I had really warm and feelings of warm and warmth and certainty. I was happy and calm. And I decided for myself that I'm going to be kind, supportive and uh, honest with him. And I'm going to praise him because I see that he's trying really hard to be this really angry but good A student. Okay, part four, I'll tell you everything. The next session he comes into the room and starts the conversation with these words, I'm going to tell you everything. And he started telling me about his family. He was an only child. His parents were still very young. They were 20 years when he was born. His father is a chemistry teacher. And his father is a teacher too. His mother is really strict and requiring. And she was also his homeroom teacher. And she became his homeroom teacher only to control his uh, academics because it was really important for her for people to see that he was an A student and he was just uh, 
burning the midnight oil and uh, studying things and and if if uh, his writing was not good his mother would tear out the pages and have him rewrite everything and if his handwriting was not good or if he if he had made any mistakes she would yell at him frequently and sometimes and he was really afraid to come home from school when he got bad grades <clears throat> And bad grades is like A minus. And if they were lower, he was even more afraid to go home. He was fidgeting with anxiety. And she his mother could hit him on the head with his with his uh, um with his uh notebooks or books. So so that would be like 90, uh, well, 80, 90 percent. If the grade is eight or 80 or 90, that's not a bad grade. But still, his mother would punish him for actually studying well. But he he only had to get the highest grades. His father would follow uh, his mother's instructions and control his homework. But the patient really believed that the father didn't care about him at all and was involved with his own matters. Before he started school, he was mostly staying with his paternal grandparents and his uncle. And he really loved him because his uncle loved him too. He was also a teacher, a teacher of math and he and physics, and he would take long walks with him um, across the village, telling him uh, various uh, interesting stories about science. And he he was helping him learn about the world and also study at the Children's Academy of Sciences. We have such organization that for academics and children. And so he won some contests there and uh, he won a prize there and he has a certificate and he was really proud to get that. He had friends at school and one of his, uh, one of them is still his friend. And after he got good grades and recognition at the Children's Academy of Sciences, he got many proposals to uh, to enter various universities. He wanted to be in IT, but his parents persuaded him to go to a military lyceum. He didn't really want to do that, but he uh, trusted his parents because the, his parents said that the career of the military is, is really quick and uh, you get good money. So he followed their advice. At first, he hated it because it was really strict. You could not, you you could not have your phone all the time. They were only given out once a week. It looked like a like a jail for juvenile delinquents. But then he, after he told me that, he said, "Well, at least I became a man there." And after he graduated from that lyceum, he went to study to. A, to the military academy and he uh, studied to become an officer then he signed con the contract with the armed forces of Ukraine and then after the full scale invasion, invasion he went to the front I asked him to re remember the first thing he to tell me about the first thing he remembered he could not, he was not able to remember anything be, before the age of six. And he remembered, he, he brought a memory when he was nine and he was staying with his paternal grandparents and his great grandmother was also still alive. She was 95 at the time and she was blind. And she, and she was uh, quote unquote talking to ghosts she was talking to her to her 
uh, dead relatives. And once when he came into the room, she told him, I talked to my godmother uh, today who uh, was long dead. He, uh, the patient hadn't even known her. And she told me, she and the ghost told me that I'm going to die tomorrow. And so she, sure enough, she died the next day. He was nine at the time and she was 95. This memory allowed me to be calm with about his interpretation and metaphor. I was sure it was a metaphor. The ones he uh, brought to our first meeting about the head of hell. And I was, this memory explained to me that it was his cultural feature to work on on these processes to to fill this uh, blindness uh, with uh, with conversations of people who were here before, and this made me more certain. And I and I was while well, I was also thinking about his any psychotic structure he might have that could have been in uh, in the way of our communication the next part i'm ready to go to p to pe to prolong disposable therapy so next time he came to the meeting and told me about it i was also ready for this of course before we had a conversation about various uh, trauma treating techniques and I told him about exposure therapy and so he gave it some thinking and came the next time and told me he was ready but the most important part was that I was ready to with bravery and calm we picked a story it was a story while he was at the front line during the combat in a short break between close combat rounds, he confused the command of snipers and he took the enemy for their own. And he only noticed it when he saw a flash about 200 meters uh, away from him from a weapon and he felt this this hot air that flew by him and burned his face and the instant explosion behind him he seemed to just remember seeing himself but seeing himself from above uh, while his buddies were were uh, around him, taking his uh, yelling and taking his uh, clothes off, and he thought he ha he had died, and he became really sad, and it, he was sorry he had such a short life, but just in case he decided to pinch his finger. So he did, and he turned out, it turned out he was alive. And then this vision was gone. He felt pain. He started getting up, yelling, running somewhere. His buddies took away his gun because he wanted to shoot them. And then after he calmed down, he, would, he was sitting for a long time, couldn't hear anything, couldn't talk. Mm -hmm. The shelling resumed. He he did not hear the explosions he just saw them and then he що зберегло його від смерті знову другий раз чомусь побратими сміялись з нього і раптом після зупинки бою принесли йому київський торт як виявляється це була традиція традиція дарувати торт тим хто другий раз народився переживши такі Переживання пов'язані з обстрілами. 
приїхала евакуація і його відправили. <кхем> Цю історію... Олег, um, for a moment there was only Ukrainian, so maybe if Oksana could go back a few lines. Something was, was it translated? Uh, that he, he, he wanted to shoot them, so he that yeah. took his weapon. Yeah. We don't hear Oksana. Okay, I'm I'm back. It was just my okay. connection. Okay. It's not just okay. just Perfect. a second. Let let me change. Okay, let me change my connection. Mm -hmm. So I. Take your time to make sure this doesn't. Можна продовжувати? Так, так, так. Окей, так, так, можна так, чути. Так. Цю, історію, цю історію ми повторили 37 разів. Олег, але може треба повторити, звідки пропустили, я не знаю. Так, Оксана вже сказала це. Окей. Цю історію ми повторили 37 разів. Ні, ні, Олег, Олег, вони, вони, не чули, вони не чули того, що сталося після того, як забрали в нього зброю. Ага, добре, зараз. Окей, okay, now we're going back to where they took his, his gun away from him. Mm -hmm. He wanted to run, sir. And then for a while he was sitting there, he could not hear anything, he could not talk. The shelling resumed. He couldn't hear them, but he was, just saw the explosions. And then he ran into a bunker, which saved him the second time. His buddies were laughing at him, but that brought him a cake. It was a tradition they had, uh, like uh, congratulations on the second birthday. And then he was sent to a hospital. And we repeated this story 37 times. And every time new details came about, and every time we were going back to the most sensitive moments of his experience. And this is a generalized story I just told you. With each day, he was sleeping better. And he was better at communication with other patients and uh, uh, medical staff, and he was compliant in his treatment. And then he was discharged. And because he had a diagnosis of PTSD, he was not sent back to the front. He was staying in the place of there, of the, of the medical, of the military. And he met his first girlfriend when he was in sixth grade and they went out six years with a few month break and then they broke up but for no obvious reason but then after he was injured this second girlfriend just 
dumped him. She just uh, uh, just put his gave his thanks to him and told him to leave, and he was really sad. But he said, "We could, we we'll get over it." That was all I wanted to tell you about this case. Do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, please tell me, you always have literature references, again. like last time it was Macbeth. This time it's the cartoon, the movie. Who Who is the second? Uh, character I did not hear very well you know that you were mm -hmm. uh, you you endure those are two characters yes. one is a little wolf yes I understood that who wants to be mean yes and the second one is Kapitoshka. It's a drop of rain. You can see there is oh, a picture rain. in that's the chat. What I, that's what that's I understood. The, the drop of the rain. I, I did not believe my ears. Yeah, you can <laughs> you can look at, at the chat. There's a picture there. Okay. From the drop cartoon. of rain. It's a drop of rain? Yes. And you became the drop of rain. Okay. Okay. There's one uh, just for everybody. There's one in the chats. If you if you uh, if you uh, push on chat, there's one picture, but it's in Ukrainian. So I think it's the little wolf, and maybe not the drop of rain. So at least we can get a picture of one of them. Yes, it's there. He's holding it. He's right. holding him. And he's holding him. Okay. I found it. It's already in the chat. Yeah, it is in so the chat. He became a character tonight. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Okay. Other uh, questions, Francoise? Another question. The, the episode that he told you about was at the beginning when he went to front or in the middle of uh, after her wife? It was after we uh, established our alliance, he started trusting me. First, he told me about his family, about his mother, who, who was mean to him and who would not allow him many, to do many things. And then it was not right away. It was like two or three sessions. And then I, I was confident enough he was not psychotic. And he uh, had trust towards me, and I had trust towards him. So I suggested we do PE, well, exposure therapy. And um, then we talked about this story when he nearly died, and then it was the next 37 times we were working on that story. It was the last phase of our relationship with him. When he said, I'm ready, when, and both both of us, of us were ready at that time. And the critical thing was also this, uh, his great-grandmother, who... who was talking to ghosts. And when he told me about this, I became totally calm because it was just cultural processing of loneliness and trauma and not 
lack of understanding, the thing that was taught to him by his great grandmother, and it might have saved his life. Another question. The, the, the moment when he nearly died, he confused the commander with the enemy. I did not understand very well. Hmm. He saw a group of snipers coming up and somehow he thought it was our group, ah. friendly group, which was supposed to be at that spot but because of his fatigue because he was just out of a previous battle and was getting ready for the next round probably because of his fatigue he confused them with the end and it was the enemy's group who tried shooting at his position and he was standing in full height there and so he saw a light And Adam. he saw the light from the uh, from the, the shell gun. going out, and <clears throat> this also <clears throat> speaks about his quick reaction because it's just a few hundred meters, and he saw it, and he could feel this warm gust of air as the shell was flying by and then the explosion a few meters behind him and they took his clothes because he was on fire now he could feel the heat on the parts of his body that were not covered So was uh, Oleg one question was uh, because I had the same question Francoise was the the fact that they took off his clothes that was a vision right it didn't really happen this is what he watched from above is that what you said okay. he was looking at himself from above and his bodies were taken it was not clothes but his uh, his his gear. Okay. Like his bulletproof vest, they were what they were examining him whether he was whether he had been wounded, ah. and he seemed to be looking from above and seeing it. He was not physically wounded. No, he wasn't. He had a concussion. Well, that's. T TBI, well, it's traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. So the could I ask you? the ghost I'm was coming sure to visit him, right? Yeah, Jerry. I, I'm not sure I'm understanding it. Did he imagine they were taking his clothes off? Yeah, yeah. Did he imagine they were taking his clothes off? Kind of no, he wasn't. He wasn't. They were really uh, taking his bulletproof vest off to see whether he had been wounded. Got it. Okay. And then he wanted to shoot, to take his weapon to shoot everywhere. Okay. That's so, what he told you at the beginning. If it does not work, I will shoot every, everybody when he entered the clinic. So just to make a link to our previous case, because I didn't provide one detail when I talked about him, there was a, there's a very similar structure in the previous case in the soldier. Um, he also confused the enemy with the, his own friends, and it led to um, it led to some deaths because he confused a drone that he thought was Ukrainian, but it was Russian. And there was then also uh, a link to that's when Francoise was beginning to talk about this soldier going berserk after he was injured and after he realized that he might have been responsible 
for some of the deaths due to his own error. So I think that the, the issue of confusion between enemy and, uh, and friend is something we're, we're listening to and watching over and over again. And uh, I think it's just an incredible additional burden and, and uh, to the mind and uh, maybe, you know, lead this uh, very um, heavy reaction of then also, you know, wanting to kill and going berserk other people. Yeah, you had some questions. Uh, I think we answered them. Okay. And the hell he comes from, you connected with the hell where the ghosts from come from in his grandma. Uh, Say great grandma saying, but in in his case it was not a metaphor. You think it's a metaphor? Yeah, but not for him perhaps. Yeah, but the hell he was living on the front was not a metaphor. Yeah. Uh, parallel to the therapy with me, the patient was working with our therapist. And uh, and he drew things. I have to close some part because it contains his name uh, to cover some parts. His, per his first picture uh, was called hell hell yes oh. and what i don't see very well what what can you describe дуже не дуже бачу що ви опишіть будь ласка що там намальовано oops This is hell, where we see the front and the five angle star. We see the stairs and we see someone is boiled in a cauldron and also explosions. This is hell. This is his first drawing in his therapy. It's in red and black and yellow. And then his second drawing. Hmm. It's different. The house? Mm-hmm. With a car. It's a house with oh, a that's car. That's a car. Oh, in front right. of a house. A, a, a house. The sun is behind the clouds, a road probably a paved road, like a co cobblestone road. And a car. And you cannot see the wheels, but they are there. And an open trunk. And the third picture, which for us therapists was total happiness. Hmm. This, I call this a picture of a healthy person where he showed his mental health through social interest. And there's a group of people, the image of a group of people, of a family a totally healthy person. I would like to say that I had this feeling that he became healthy. 
and uh, it it uh, it also goes to show when a person gains social interest it is a sign of mental health he just made an illustration to this a present to individual psychology and uh, i picked this case because there are many interesting cases that we have in our clinic and i picked this case exactly because of this last drawing because it was a message from him saying that i'm well again Oleg, what happened with the girlfriend i was also i wasn't quite clear about that because he said at the very beginning of the treatment that he wanted to see the girlfriend He had two girlfriends. Uh, first one, he was dating for eight years, but that was since grade six. And when, when they were 19, they had serious relationship, including sexual one, but then they broke up and he wasn't really willing to tell me why. And then he met another girl when he was already in service and he dated her and they had a more turbulent relationship but when he got sick well actually not when he when he get, got this reaction to heavy stress she started avoiding him and he would be calling her every now and then and he started bothering her and so she she became scared of this so she just uh, kicked him out so to speak she just put his things out of her apartment put put them outside and and as a as an observer i thought it was quite unfair she could have done it differently well, was that the girlfriend he told you at the beginning he was afraid she would die? And that's why he had... To... That's the same one. Okay. Uh, I, I want to come back to the... Well, there is all his childhood with this very uh, exigent, uh, exigent... I don't know if you say that. Demanding, demanding... Demanding mother. Demanding mother, yeah. But I, I, first, I wonder if this has an effect uh, on the PTSD uh, status, because what I heard is whatever are the childhood and the difficulties, the overwhelming uh, uh, violence they go through goes uh, transgress all the limits. But what I've found very, very interesting was your first uh, immediate reaction of calm while he was showing himself up, literally getting out of hell. He was like a dead alive. When he was, afterward, when he tells you he is completely uh, unable to talk and unable to feel and unable to, uh, to, to realize, he's he thinks he's, he was dead. He pinches his uh, finger. So he comes back from the dead, literally. And thanks to your uh, calmness and the first, the way you can put it in a cultural, the place where the ghosts come back, the unrested souls, you know, in my practice, I don't believe in ghosts, but they fill out my office. <laughs> See, that's exactly the, the, the way you were. So he's no more a ghost. He's, you can greet him 
out of hell. By and your second, well, or your first uh, reaction with this cartoon, you, as I told you, you really use your culture. Mm -hmm. uh, to, I remember the beautiful verse of Macbeth you quoted. I went to look at it in Macbeth. Uh, the, this wolf and the drop of rain. But I think in his case, he is not trying to be scary or mean. He tries, he just expresses what he has become coming out of hell. Nobody himself, no, no more himself. Wanted perhaps he wants to show the scary, uh, the fear that perhaps he did not feel. I wonder, because when he went out of this situation, he was like uh, free, frozen. When he felt the 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 heat of the dust and the, the the light he did not realize what was happening only he was dead so is that the path that you i think that the path you connect you took to connect him like at the in the last drawing you were his first relationship you were his first connection with a social uh, relationship, thanks to your uh, culture, but not only culture, but uh, the way you use it. I do believe in relationship in therapy because it, when they are conscious and I was watching him closely really closely and the first thing that caught my eye is his uh, uh, is the way he was groomed with all these scary ideas about killings and hell he was dre neatly dressed and his hair was neatly cut who was looking after his appearance and who was requiring of himself and now that you mentioned his mother she was also there she was there with this uh with this aggressive uh, uh demand to be perfect towards them she was his mother who was just yelling at everyone to uh, at everyone to do things right because if you don't i'll just kill you i'll just hit you uh on the head with a book but that's you could not take you could not it could not uh, be taken seriously but it still has to be respected and i said i i was going to warn him about being uh perfect with you but they just have to do what they what they are trained to and he actually heard what i was saying Yes. And I really liked Jean's interpretation that we could not sometimes tell we cannot sometimes tell uh, friends from foes, and this is this issue of trust and distrust, and that's how he was looking at me, that he was looking at me thinking, is that friend or foe? And that's why he demonstrated this stubbornness and this, this, the, uh, these demands and, and watching me closely. Is that our snipers or is that the enemy's snipers? Well, he did another thing. Uh, as you, you began the case, there's so much in the case that sometimes we forget the beginning. I at least do. But you said it's the first case that you called. Uh, you called him, uh, that he set it up in this complicated way with the phone that you ended up calling him and you said it's the only case you've ever called. So I think that that was also a kind of test to see, are you friend and foe? And although we have Francoise here, I'm going to quote you anyway. Uh, Francoise often says that um, uh, 
what the traumatized person wants to know is who are you you know who am i talking to are you a a person or in this case a ghost or are you my friend or my my enemy so how especially i think around the questions we have about to what extent we can maintain a abstinent position in this kind of work uh, it's impossible, I think. And I remember Jerry saying a long time ago, if you maintain a neutral position, if that's even possible, you'd be um, treated with contempt. So I think that you showing yourself so personally and also remembering the cartoon uh, and calling him really established uh, an, an, an incredible trust. Uh, for a guy who must have been so frightened. Yeah, I think we have to have a relationship, but we still have to, to watch out really closely. We have to be really careful because this relationship and the insights we tell patients have to be really thoughtful because you can end up in a snare of projections and you still have to keep some distance. It definitely, it, it shouldn't have analytic abstinence, but it has to have some kind of distance. Yeah. That's for sure. And that's what I kept testing all the time, testing this distance and this even medical distance, authority distance, I was the distance of the rules of the boundaries because you will go to your girlfriend but we have to finish this business you came here for in the first place we have a shared responsibility and he was ready for that he stopped arguing he would go to his room mm -hmm. and follow instructions but but the distance here is also important because your abstinence have to be selective, but the boundaries have to be kept. And these patients make you break your boundaries, just like any patients, but those in particular, they just want to. And we also have a few cases that are worth presenting here. The cases when the distance was broken by the therapist unconsciously and not really broken, but it allowed to turn on many other fantasies of the patients. And we, 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 we look at these cases at our staff meetings because traumatized patients and soldiers, they can be really provoking. Jean, could I jump in here? Absolutely, Jared. I yeah, was waiting. Um, uh, Oleg, I, I, I was, I was very interested in your your statement that you, uh, you called him and and you had not done that before, and as I recall, he said to you, "I'll come because you called me." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, why did you choose to call him? because his body described a suffering person to me, just a suffering man who has no chance, no way to, to alleviate this suffering. And I remember that moment when he told me about this, and I know that body of his, it's from life, it's an acquaintance of mine. Now it's a really decent and caring man. And uh, I told him that I just had to call. I told him myself, I just had to call. The first thing I did in the morning was calling the front line. And the issue is also, where are you calling? Somewhere out there in the field. And so those were two moments when I saw the suffering of his and his helplessness. And the other thing was that I trusted the man who asked me about it. 
it was also important for him. So, so I did it. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, I mean, the implication to me is that um, you saw a body suffering, but the person who was in that body could not bring it to you unless you reached out, which seems to me really important. Um, there's something about his declaring, I need help. Uh, he, he couldn't do that on his own initiative. He needed you to reach out to him to say to him, I, I hear what your body is saying. Would you please come in? And he did. There's something about that that's very important, it seems to me. And what I find myself thinking about this man is that in a sense, the you know, if you will, the pre-existing condition, the thing he was struggling with before he got into the military was, as he said, becoming a man. Um, there's something about how he felt kind of bullied by his mother, his father's absent. Um, he uh, is pushed into the military school. It's as though he he's following her orders in his life. Um, and uh, But uh, to his good fortune, he has a wonderful relationship with his uncle. You know, when you when you study child development, uh, you know, basically there are only two reasons why a child does anything that a parent says, fear or love. Um, and it sounds like this young man was afraid of his parents, afraid of his mother especially, but discovered a loving parent in his uncle. And I think discovered that in you very quickly, um, really kind of astonishingly quickly. Uh, as Francoise was saying, the, the fact that you kind of instantly understood this man to be not the raging maniac he said he was going to be, but rather a, a frightened person trying to act like he was uh, a very big man. And uh, you, you, you. Uh, I guess that's that's what came through in the cartoon as well, a wolf. Uh, but right next to the wolf is the is the is the drop of rain that could be heard as a tear. Uh, whatever it is, it, it dissolves the uh, aggression of the wolf, and um, and and sees right through it to the uh, the more uh, sad or uh, frightened child there. Um, so, and I, I was very taken with the fact that you, you sat with him in silence and watched the cartoon. There's something so interesting about that. What, what a wonderful intervention. So, um, I, I guess part of what I'm saying is you in your feeling toward him began a kind of a diagnostic process. How much is this man a serious threat? of violence versus how much is there something else going on, something more tender, more frightened, more sad, perhaps. And that diagnostic process, I think, continued through his story about his grandparents. You came out of that feeling that this man is not psychotic. Um, and, and, and on that basis could make your next move toward exposure therapy. So it, it's just a fascinating story. Thank you for telling it to us. Thank you, Jerry. And I would like to tell you, and while you were saying this, and before you said that this, uh, this uh, drop of rain could well be a tear, I I had this feeling of tearful sadness, and I tears were welling in my eyes it's the, the in this parental way that you said it but i also have this response that as a rule most of our patients especially the military who suffer from ptsd and concussion and that is a known fact i that that's not something i invented they also have avoidant behavior toward the the treatment they don't come on their own. They try to avoid help. Therefore, at the hospital, we have put together an internal protocol where our 
therapists and psychologists well we have the, these clinical rounds and we so we are in this reaching out stance we come we approach them we talk to them we uh, find them and we invite them to treatment and maybe that's also a part of our matrix why i was not afraid to call him why i just reached out to him and uh, i think it's a really important moment for therapists because we're not used to going after our patients it's a kind of neurotic pro process they have to come see us but this is a whole different process where avoidance Absolutely. is the symptom and reaching out is an absolute a necessity and the second thing is that many of these uh, patients have trust issues and you have to create this trust uh, among other things by your uh, honest stance I don't think you just you need to frustrate your patients by silence for example because that does not Add up to add to trust, and you cannot do anything without trust. Yep, yep. I also thought it was very interesting that um, the the one of the first statements is this this has to work, or I'm going to kill everybody. And uh, what you eventually come to is that uh, in that traumatic incident, he did have the impulse to kill everybody. Uh, so in a sense, it, it's almost like those moments in trauma where uh, something that's that's thought about as a future event, I will kill everybody, was actually a past event. Uh, I had the impulse to kill everybody back on the in that in that moment, uh, and it it's it's a uh, there's something about the way as Francoise talks about. Time doesn't exist in trauma. Past and future are the same thing. And that's one of the things that got sorted out in, in the work. Exactly. And you put time in motion when you looked at the cartoon together. Because mm. he was no more alone in that timeless time. And there was a story going where you took your part. But uh, I just have a, a, another uh, question. It's about the birthday cake that he received when he left. What, what was the, you say that his friends, his buddies were laughing at him, were mocking him. That, and you say it's uh, usual or what? Is, I did not understand. We don't know why they were laughing at him. Perhaps he was saying some things that were funny because he could not remember quite well because he was uh, after a concussion. He couldn't hear. He had hearing disturbance. He couldn't hear what was being said to him, and he could not quite make out. Maybe, maybe they were just happy because the the battle was over and they survived. But then suddenly they brought him a cake, cake you cake, and who knows where they got it. And I just want to tell you about time. And we, we never agreed as to how long it lasted, a day, half a day or a whole day or two days. And when he was evacuated, Actually, until today, this continuum of uh, the traumatic event is not synchronized, and it's not; it does not have a timeline. This is how how we imagined this uh, this process. This is a really important point in PTSD, because mm -hmm. usually you can. Only you can reproduce the event only after six hours, but the cake, it was a triumph of life over death. Because the cake 
it was cake for his second birthday because on the day you, you say that on the day you escape your death you are born again exactly that's what i understood oh thank you because that was my understanding yeah so the muck the laughter is also uh, i think a life reaction of his of his body and the the cake yes you are you are you you are coming from hell and hell is without time like in dante you who enter in this hell uh, you abandon all all uh, expectancy uh, all hope and there was some hope with the birthday cake like a second birth yeah i i wonder too whether whether or like you introduced some kind of time because you repeated uh, a couple of times that it took 37 times for him to recount what had happened to him. I thought that was really interesting that you would count and that that sequence existed. I'm, I'm wondering if you could say more about that. I usually count the sessions and times, but this time I was especially meticulous about it because it's really interesting incorrect uh, prolonged exposure therapy relief comes during first four to seven sessions and in these sessions depending on the on the length of the story you can repeat a story once or twice or three times or 15 times even and it was a long story that's why we we it, it took us a few days to work on it mm -hmm. And you say new details came back each time. Always. And the details, I have this metaphor that we're coming closer to the eyes of death. Mm -hmm. And those details are the small details that brings you closer to that moment. Yeah. But he was no more alone. He could go closer because you were there. Yeah, and the safety. He could approach it because it was safe. He trusted me and he trusted the situation and himself. And so that's where he went towards. When I was listening to this whole st your whole presentation and Jerry and John and, you know, comments, I was thinking by contrast, how many soldiers came back from war in a frantic rage and were treated like manic and like dangerous and, and were put to psychic death. Many of them. And uh, were accused of uh, on the appearance with people who were completely outside and just and so it's a wonderful lesson uh, for further therapists who would deal with them because it's so opposite to what we are used to here uh, after the wars, except from people like you, but they existed too before, but in a little uh, numbers. And so when you quoted, uh, who are you? It was not me. It was Dori Laub. I, I, I want to be honest. We are in the realm of trust. Who are you? So I can talk to you. And he used to disclose something from his own whatever. Mm -hmm. Not private, because it's never private when catastrophes happen. But you disclose. Yeah. Who are you? You came with a cartoon. Uh, he got something of you, of your, I well, don't know, your healing process with the big wolves. That there are some little ones which look, try to look mean. 
Yeah. So it's a transformation. Francois says also in English, I don't know if that exists in Ukrainian, the, the term crying wolf. Oh, it's yeah. called and crying. it means sort of you 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 you're you're making something big out of something little. Crying wolf. Crying wolf. Crying wolf. Right, Jerry? Uh, so yeah. uh, you know, he was coming in as this big guy uh, saying he would kill everybody if uh, uh, if he wasn't healed uh, you know as as you said uh, look, i mean acting very threateningly commanding you even though the way he was dressed and the way he looked didn't match up at all up his uh, his uh, his words and it very much fills and that's why i thought it also was so uh, uh, so wonderful that that is the cartoon that came to your mind to, uh, to your yeah. mind but yeah. i'm not sure whether the same <clears throat> thing exists in in ukraine <clears throat> but it, it, yeah but what, you what, know what, if if oleg had not reacted like that he could become the real big bad wolf yeah yeah, yeah. he had met people who did not trust or were you know sneaky or who were just contempting he would have become really, and he would be right. Hmm. Uh, you know, I was thinking about that when he was uh, kept on telling me he wanted to go see his girlfriend, and I was sitting and thinking that it was not safe, and that in some, and I can really be directive enough because it's a psychiatric hospital. And this thought that came to me, because it was it could be dangerous for him and for other people. But then I started telling him that, look, you made agree an agreement with me. You told me, and I just came to him and told him, remember we made a deal. You told me you were going to come to me because I called you. So let's finish this. Yeah. And because he is healthy constitutionally he said okay he, he was not arguing with me because if he had been psychotic he would have argued with me mm -hmm. you know i think i think there's something uh about that oleg that that may touch on the notion of the name of the father you know first of all this guy is so dependent on his mother to tell him what to do he comes into the hospital, he says, I've got to see my girlfriend who's about to kick me out. And you say to him, no, you've got some work to do first. And he says, okay. And when the work is done, what does he say? He says, we'll get over it. We don't need her as much anymore because he's got a relationship with you and he's come back to his strength as, a, as an independent person. It's, it's uh, I, I, I like that. Uh, just back a couple of steps, Francoise, I think the, the, the cartoon that comes to Oleg's mind, would that be an example of Thomas Salmon's idea of immediacy? Yeah. That is, exactly. in, in the presence of this patient, this is what comes to Oleg's mind. Exactly. That's, uh, that's uh, you. The, all of our uh, meetings, the 14th now, the Salmon principles are present and, you know, immediately, uh, because you are in a timeless situation, you have to, work, to act and pro be proactive here and now. Yeah. And that's what you did very quickly. And uh, that's the only way you cannot. Uh, and, and, and I think what follows is very, very important. You, you bring this piece of you but it's a piece of you that relates to a piece of him. You bring that to him and you watch the cartoon together. Mm -hmm. And um, it's like Jonathan Shea, who reads the Iliad to traumatized yeah. veterans. It's yeah. working in displacement. He can look at this. He can step forward, step back. He And what happens afterward? After that, you tell him, you know, anger can be simply energy. And after that, he says to you, I'm going to tell you everything. 
that's, a, that's, a, that's exactly yeah. anger is energy is Jonathan Shea, uh point you know he he was following some uh, scholar in Harvard uh, about the Iliad and when he heard the rhythm he heard he was at a place for uh, Vietnam uh, traumatized soldiers in a veteran's hospital and he heard them shout, uh, on dit, uh, juré, uh, uh, juré? On dit, juré, uh, insulting, you know, um, motherfucking and motherfucking, and you know, their shouts like that. He heard them like the rhythm in the Iliad. He thought it's, but it's like what you did. It's not only, oh, that's always the same. You know, uh, come on, dit juré, uh, okay, juron, person, swear, 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 swear. Exactly. swear. it's not yeah. only bad swears, and <laughs> he heard them like energy of anger starting to take the shape of a rhythm of breathing instead of looking at it as brutal or so on, and this is the beginning of life, rhythm, rhythm. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what you say, anger is energy. When somebody, is, like you did, is able to start the rhythm with the patient in between. That's what you started with the cartoon, but you went on with different, with the, with the grandma ghost. You introduce the cultural, and there was a rhythm, like in old tales, where it's very violent in tales. So the don't um, don't you think that this rhythm he Oleg introduced was also the rhythm with the with the wished for mother, with you know, the with the wished for mother. I mean, the mother that that he described her rhythm was yelling and barking at him and controlling him this was not the kind of mother it sounds like that sat next to him and watched a cartoon so yeah. i think it was a way in which um yes there was the paternal but i think oleg also represented and started the the uh, in a way the, the beginning of the therapy with this with sitting next to him we had that last time too the the, the 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 courage I think you show over and over again to sit with your patients quite closely and in this case watch something uh, together because it also could have gone very badly with this guy I mean he could have uh, felt very put down by that what are you doing showing me a cartoon no he he there was something that he picked up about that that. Uh, gesture of yours, I think that that was, that introduced a different rhythm than the yelling and barking rhythm of the mother. That's what you say. I'd like to tell you something that when I was reflecting on that cartoon and I was thinking whether I should show it to him or not. I was thinking about the characters and Kapitoshka was not, it's actually, it's a she, is it feminine? Mm -hmm. But, but it was really a stance of a caring mother. It was like Jean said, it was the mother who sat next to him and watched a cartoon with him. It was a feminine thing. And I was thinking why I why it didn't sit right with me. Because I wanted to be a man next to him, a big wolf, so to say. But I also had to be this gentle person and Kapitoshka is feminine. Although this character was masculine, he was his friend. Because it didn't really matter what it was, because water is 
it was water and water is also mother water is ideal mother you can do anything you wish with a mother like that right yes but kapitoshka it's also a head because kapitus is kaput is head in latin so ah. Are there are there questions, comments from the audience? Uh, we still have almost half an hour. Um, Alexander, do you want to say something? Well, I, I want to say many things, but I'm I'd say I'm a little fascinated by this case and by the discussion and the way it is unfolding uh, ever more wide and interesting and with the continuations. You know, I, I just want to say two things. How important it turns out to, in any therapy, even in seemingly behavioral therapy, although Olaf didn't mention that when we uh, have these discussions between us is that exposure therapy con contains really a lot of, it hides a lot of dynamic, psychodynamic mysteries. But there's also one more thing that how important it is how important is the first relationship with the patient and a possibility of quick engagement of the patient into therapeutic alliance. And in order to do that, you, you really have to have a really profound intuition to act the way Olaf has acted. And I was thinking to myself, if for example, you go to Thurnberg Institute and tell him, look, what an interesting example of counter-transference interpretation because the cartoon they watched together um, came about in the left head during the first, mm -hmm. uh, the first conversation. It was like a reverie, a memory of this cartoon and how this interpretation invited the patient into relationship so well. And another interesting term I would like to suggest that really exact and uh, correct and spot on psychodynamic interpretation and maybe psychodynamic interpretations in general, they are They are about um, about uh, uh, agreeing between the obvious uh, beliefs of the patient and the uh, therapist. And, I'm, and this bringing together of two obvious things. So if you intuitively guess the most the, the most obvious truth of this patient that he is a scared wolf and uh, guessing this thing gives a really quick access to the relationship and the patient starts trusting you really quickly because he understands that the patient can understand really deep and really simple things about him. The things I call the obvious and so this uh, this fit of the two was perfect and I, I think I should stop here and I was really moved by that and all the comments were like a spiral that is winding one on on the other and I, I'm also interested in hearing more thoughts this is what I wanted to say Well, I'm going to say something more because I, while you were talking, uh, Oleg, 
uh, and where we had yeah. the discussion, I was thinking of the last case you presented to us um, of the woman who you also went after and picked her up in her room who was in a wheelchair and could barely walk. Um, and you had a way of, uh, and I know uh, talked with Francoise about it too, the way she yelled at you yeah. in Russian when you asked her about her history. And you had no right. She had said. no right to ask her. So there's a moment. Well, we <laughs> talked about it and we were just, uh, I, I was really stunned by that. Um, by the development of the case and the way you took on, you know, her her aggression because so many others would have been frightened. And we talked a long time about how maybe others would have not let her speak in Russian, but you know, immediately translated into Ukrainian. And my sense, if I may say that, that you have a real knack, or you have a real good intuition for not being frightened by the the, the seeming aggression. Uh, that these people come in. So I think there's some really interesting parallels between these two cases. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Good. Cool. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> so you yes. see, Alexander, even though you went, you couldn't talk today, you were very much. Right. In Alex's mind. Yeah. He's exaggerating. <laughs> but that's the important thing, not to be afraid of patients. That's the important thing, not to be afraid of patients. Mm -hmm. You want to say more about it, Dan? No, 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 no. But that's what we, we what was the problem in the hospital where I worked and everywhere with the traumatized patients and psychosomatic patients, not to be afraid of of them. Mm. And that is the first test, the first encounter. There is that kind of test, very quick. Who are you? Are you afraid? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I'm, I have something, you know, of course, there was that tender and drop of, of unfeminine presence and uh, that's wonderful. But at the same time, it will be the condition to greet very, very tough uh, narratives, you know, that he is able to, 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 and to, pro, to tell you. And that means that it has to be also not to be afraid of what is going to come in the narrative. It's not only you know, you are a tender person behind your age, but there is also real cruelty. And there is also ghosts like, ghosts are mean also. You know, so you, you, you have to be, not to be afraid to with that violence uh, and uh, at whatever, whatever it takes. And that is in the different uh, stages that you described afterward. So uh, you're very right. 
I want to tell you that most of the stories in, in the expositional therapy of the patients, they're very scary. Yeah. And it's very scary to hear it. Yeah. It's sometimes you are frozen by, by, the, by the fear. And, uh, and, uh, and you cannot even predict it, you know, how scary it is. And it's a very painful moment in the, in the, in the therapy. Yeah, to be able to but stand. You, you, yeah, you have to, you have to, you have to make this immediate, every second decision. Yeah, of, of the what to do with this because sometimes because you don't have a long relationship with the patients and you don't know what they need actually at the moment. They need the the чиwny potrzebujuć свівчуття, чи вони потребують підстримки сили, і ми цього, you have, to, you have to feel it, yeah. Uh, it's a very intensive uh, therapy, and, 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 um, and, and you have to, you have to be very careful. Yeah, not to... And sometimes, and sometimes, this is the worst, this is the worst, sometimes those, uh, those stories so scary, that you are afraid to say it to your supervisor. Supervisor. Mm -hmm. That no, I cannot say it because of scary. No, I, I have no rights to say it. And, and you are going with this for day by day. And finally, said, no, it's crazy. You're crazy. You have to have to go and tell it. Yeah. And uh, it's it's very uh, interesting uh, projection of the of the of the uh, eyes of death, yeah. <laughs> hmm. But in the narrative, in the even if it's really, you know, is 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 there is not a, a beginning of transformation into telling with words. So the, the choice of words is also a creative process from that rule. Um, uh, raw, uh, scary material. So you, telling sto a story, whatever, is a beginning of healing. What do you think about that? Healing. Ah, healing. Yes. You know, neurophysiology of this is selling this. Yeah, the making the cognition working yeah, and the word is a cognition it's a it's a it's a speaking it's a prefrontal cortex yeah you are uh, starting the healing yeah because you are because the the cognition is tuning off during the trauma you know he said about this i was not speaking and i don't hear anything and nasha zadacha включити кору почати говорити and and when you don't feel like telling this story to your supervisor it's actually the trauma is catching it's it's actually a really bad thing is that your cortex just turns off and you're a, a subject of secondary trauma it just doesn't feel like talking and we're going back to Shakespeare here. Let the sorrow speak. That's it. <laughs> and the heart, what? there's something with the heart. Go on, tell us. Yeah. But, but on this subject of, um, in a sense, uh, the transition from the body you know, my body suffers nausea, nausea, etc. To words, I wanted to ask you about the art therapy and the role you you see for the art therapy in this, because you know, between the body and words, there are sometimes images which uh, came up in the course of the art therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought the three images you showed of had a, showed us had a fascinating progression in them. The first, the hell, there was no structure whatsoever. The second, there was a structure, precarious, sliding down that slope. And the third, there was not only a structure, but there were relationship links. You know, 
hands were being held. And uh, so, you know, there, there's, there's a lot one can see in that. But I think the fact of putting images on paper is also part of the transition from bodies to words. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's an integration of all feelings uh, in, in some visual uh, uh, cortex, yeah? Uh, because mm -hmm. visual cortex, according to the, the neuropsychology, neurobiological um, uh, model, is also a part of the PTSD, yeah? Uh, because the, 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 the mm, it's, you know, those traumatic events is then, them recorded and repeated, yeah. And now we're doing something else, yeah. Visual arts, yeah. We are producing different, different vision, and I think it's very important for us in our model. The therapy, art therapy, is must be done uh, in the model of treatment of PTSD. It's not an option. It's it's an obligation for mm -hmm. all difficult patients to have a art therapeutic sessions. Um, and our, our therapist, we are lucky, uh, very lucky. Uh, and, and he is, I hope, uh, present today. I have seen him. Um, he is not only uh, the artist and the therapist, art therapist, he is a psychoanalyst. That's why he is connecting yeah, those uh, things together. You know, images, colors, uh, emotions, cognition in one uh, uh, Amalgama. And he's also an artist? Yes, yes, he has a first, first his first education, uh, uh, he is an artist, yeah. Alexander. Знаєте, я про арт-терапію, це дуже таке, ну, я б сказав, класне питання, яке виникло, воно... It really, Oleg, is right that we, we don't have art therapy in all of our clinics. Well, but we also use it in our psychotherapy, psychiatry clinic for a complex patients very often in our all of, all our art therapists have additional education many of them psychodynamic and why i think this is important because when when you think about it uh, as an outline that uh, traumatic art therapy is like dreams and like trauma it's in visual images and so this this job Ola has done, he took all these images, these unconscious traumatic images, he uh, took them into the verbal context and we can see the transformation that has taken place. The first was hell, the one he came with, and then it was this middle uh, picture and the third picture, picture was the most peaceful one. It's as if this uh, this picture has been drawn in two words, fixated there, and then this picture, the peaceful one, when the family is moving down the road, and then these images are, it's as if they took out this bad picture, fixed it, and then sent it back, corrected and fixed. Well, it's a mechanical fantasy, but we uh, we did see it for ourselves that if our therapy is combined with uh, a psychoanalytic understanding, it really speeds up the process. And uh, I'm I'm great. I'm happy that Oleg was able to illustrate it so well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. But I would like to say, I just noticed that Oros Vasilic is right here. And I would really like to thank him for his wonderful partnership. And Oros, 
Are you the patient? Hello. They're exaggerating a little. Oh, you are the psychotherapist. I would like to say an important is, thing. Is it the patient? Is your feminine? Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. I just wanted to say another important thing that is also in connection with neurobiological model because repetition, uh, as in exposure therapy, it's rewriting. Rewriting history, but in a safe, uh, under safe conditions and a condition that no longer bothers sympathetic nervous system. It's, it gets recorded, recorded in a different file and it's put into archives because you cannot forget anything. But every now and then when we go back uh, to uh, certain events, but we take it from the archives, not directly from our head, we can cry about it, we can grieve grieve about it, but it does not take over our life. It does not run our life. Mm. This is in accordance to neurobiological model of trauma, which is no different from psychodynamic one, by the way. And yeah. so in the archives, we have substituted health for a totally different picture. No more, it's no more a memory which cannot forget. <laughs> I see that we have four minutes to go, and I would like to outline one little detail for our colleagues. And Francois said, mentioned it too, that we are going to have a lot of patients who are going to have psychotic disorders and PTSD, a whole lot. And it's really important. This differential diagnosis is so important. It's so important not to make a mistake because when we treat this patient from psychotic disorder, not from psychotic uh, symptom uh, PTSD, we're going to... Uh, to exacerbate his condition and make him uh, to to disable him actually, and mm -hmm. so the psychodynamic diagnostic process has to be accompanied by supervision each time. Time, and we keep discussing our patients. We keep sharing our thoughts because that's the only. If unless we do that, we can we can uh, bring a lot of trouble to our patients. If we lock them up as a psychotic patients, then we become their enemies and there will be no trust towards us, no trust towards medical, mental health institutions. And I think that's the biggest challenge for us in, in st both psychiatry and psychotherapy. And then he's going to shoot us Yes, he will, and he will have every right to do that because in his imagination, we're going to be ones. He will not mix us, but we will be the ones who will mix friends and foes. So thank you, Francoise, for this detail that we, for this point that we're going to have many patients like that in the future. Well, it becomes time again, comes time again to thank you all again. Do you want to say something, Francoise? Before yes, I always am impressed, but this time even more by the thorough in, engage, engagement involvement of the of the analyst at the beginning, and that makes the following uh, it's the condition, and that's a huge lesson from what Alexander characterized by you know the mainstream analysis. Don't intrude, don't suggest, don't this, don't that. You do, you do it. And thank you very much. The big that, that, that's what I meant by not neutral position. You know, you become a human to them. That doesn't mean you lose the distance, but you yes. present yourself as human. And I think that's so important. Jerry, do you want to say? Yes, 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 just, yes, you do it. Thank you. <laughs>
So we just want to remind you we are a little bit out of schedule. We've had our very consistent structure, but because of time constraints and commitments, our next meeting is not going to be again on the third Thursday of the month, but on the last Thursday of the month, which is the 28th of March. So I very much hope to see you all again then. Thank you very much. Alexander is going to find an, another amazing case again, and maybe himself. And um, and uh, I see that Peter is just putting in the uh, in the chat that those who would like to donate some money towards the Ukrainian causes that uh, Kurt Winter and Erika Trappel I have organized now for a few years. The information is in your chat box. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, Oksana. Yeah. Yes, just I really uh, would like to say thank you for today's supervision. For me, it was very important. And uh, thank you for your kindness and uh, sincerity. And thank you, Oksana, for her work. Oh, yes. Uh, Thank you, Oksana. Thank you so much, as always. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Jerry. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye.